Hello everyone! In this video I will show you how to assign a point group to molecules using a very simple diagram based on four questions. Before we jump in, I would like to highlight one important thing. In the last video we said that there are the symmetry operations that are the most important. We said that when a molecule has D4H symmetry, it has these symmetry operations. The whole process of predicting the number of IR stretches, etc., which is the reason why you are learning group theory, will be revolving around symmetry operations. However, to assign a molecule to a certain type of symmetry, we will look for key symmetry elements. Why? Because we are lazy. This, however, comes at a certain price. We need to maintain certain order in which we look for these key symmetry elements. That's why we use flowchart. So anyway, as always, timestamp, slides, and my additional comments are below the video. So let's start. So to determine the point group of molecules, uh, as we said, we ask four questions. Question one is, is the molecule a special case? The idea is that you don't need to use any algorithm to distinguish some symmetries. For instance, how hard is to notice that a molecule is linear? So that immediately cuts the size of the algorithm in half. Second question is, what is the principal axis? That is a bit of a common sense, because principal axis is the most obvious element to notice. Usually planes of reflections or additional axes are a little bit more tricky to spot. Question three is very crucial. Is there n C2 axis perpendicular to the main axis. If yes, then we end up in D set. Let's take benzene as an example. For now, I will tell you that benzene is not a special case. In the last video, we said that benzene has C6 axis and it also has 6 C2 axis, 3 C2 prime that goes through two carbons and 3 C2 prime prime that cuts through the bonds. And notice the notation of prime and prime prime, it's what most books use, although sometimes lecturers and myself uh, I'm a bit, a little bit loose with the notation. And just please remember that in the previous video, we said that the presence of N C2 axis is characteristic for regular polygons. D set is later divided into D and D, D and H and DN, but that's easy once you know what the symbol stands for, so we will just leave it for later. Now, if the answer to question 3 is negative, then we ask question 4. Is there S to N? So let's say the principal axis is C2. Is there S4? That where you need to be a little bit careful because D and D has also S to N symmetry operations. So you cannot just ask question 2, what's the principal axis, and then jump to the question 4. Later in the video, I will give you a specific example for that. To be fair, there are only a few molecules that have S to N symmetry, but still be careful. If the answer to question 4 is positive, then the point group for our particular molecule is S to N. And if the answer is negative, then we end up in C set. So let's look at the same diagram, but with little more details. I didn't really explain what special case means. So special case can be divided into molecules with very low symmetry, meaning that they have very few symmetry elements, and very high symmetry, meaning that they have lots of symmetry elements, linear or polygons. Let's start with low symmetry. So if you look at the molecule and you cannot see any symmetry elements apart from E, of course, then the group is C1. I haven't found any explanations in any of the books I used what the subscripts really stand for, so I'm not 100% sure, but I remember the name by realizing that C1 group has only one symmetry element in it, E. Then there is a CS, it has only one plane of symmetry and E, but I remember the name because for me S stands for sigma and I think maybe it does. Um, then there is a CI group, which elements are the inversion and E, so I for me stands for inversion. Just notice that R, O, platinum, O, R are not in one plane, because I think that the picture is actually a little bit ambiguous. So the oxygens are in one plane, but the R groups are not. One is below and one is above the plane. Next, let's talk about polygons. We have TD, OH, and IH. The characteristic feature is that they have more than two axes of rotation, C3, C4, and C5 respectively. If any polygons appears at an exam, it will be obvious. For TD, it will be a molecule or ion with four identical simple ligands and tetrahedral geometry, because TD is a symmetry of a perfect tetrahedron. For OH, again, central atom and six simple ligands and octahedral geometry, OH is a symmetry of a perfect octahedron. I really doubt that IH will appear at exam. IH describes a symmetry of a perfect icosahedron. I would really encourage you to go to the website and see some examples of molecules with IH symmetry and other symmetries as well. In principle, we don't learn for an exam, but there is no point to beat yourself up because in real life you will use software for modeling, optimizing, and it will automatically find symmetry operations. The idea is that we learn some basic principles on small molecules so that when you use software for some more complex systems, things are not totally alien for you. 
Please notice that I keep saying simple ligands. These are the ligands where we can establish the symmetry of the ion molecule by simply analyzing the arrangements of the ligands. We don't need to worry that the ligands themselves add or take away any symmetry elements by twisting or packering, etc. So the simple ligands will be made of a single atom, like halides, or they will be linear. Sometimes we can deal with a bit more complex ligands by assuming free rotation, and in solution, in some cases, is a reasonable assumption. And so for this example, where ammonia are ligands, we may also say that the complex has OH symmetry because of free rotation. I don't see this last example on exam either, because usually there is no ambiguous questions on exams like that, so just treat a molecule as static, assign a point group, and bobs your ankle. But in this video I will try to give you a little bit more context, and by the way, later I will show you more examples where the books tell you to make some simplifications about the shape of ligands. So as we said, we're only dealing with some simple cases, and we are not even describing all the point groups. For instance, in reality there is a T set, O set, and I set, which are then divided. For instance, T set of groups is divided into T, TH, and TD, but commonly they will be only introduced to TD. So just for sake of, I guess, some completion, let's look at symmetry elements in T set of groups. Let's look at T group first, and let's look at this example, calcium cation surrounded by six THF solvent molecules. THF stands for tetrahydrofuran, is a cyclic ether. So T group has only axis of rotation, four C3s and three C2s. The C2s are along XYZ, and C3 you can easily see if you tilt the molecule. Now, we would probably probably anticipate some more symmetry elements, like maybe S6, but that is not the case because the rings are not flat, the carbon is sp3. Now that is in contrast to the example with TH symmetry. We have ion cations surrounded by six pyridines. Pyridine is aromatic, the rings are flat. And now there is indeed S6, not only that but also three planes and a center of inversion. Please notice that in both examples we describe molecules with six ligands. Chemists would say that they have octahedral arrangement of ligands or that the complex have octahedral geometry but that doesn't mean, strictly, mathematically speaking, that such complexes have OH symmetry. As I said above, only with simple ligands, it will be true that complexes that have octahedral geometry has also OH symmetry. In the books I browsed through, only Tar, or however that's pronounced, mentions TH symmetry, and he uses this example. How he even came up with this confirmation? Notice that these two ligands are arranged, let's call it vertically, and these are arranged, let's say, horizontally. We just look a second ago at complex with ammonia ligands, and it was OH due to the rapid rotation of the ligands. So that is an interesting example. So first, please note that there are two substituents on nitrogen, so they are not L ligands like ammonia. Also, C and C are in one plane, so we could think of nitrogen as sp2 hybridized, and that allows for some back donation, that is, some additional interaction of field p orbital on nitrogen with the metal. So we might say there is some double bond character in bonding between metal and nitrogens, restricting the rotation, so that is a bit of a justification. Of course, in solution, the structure will be a bit wobbly, uh, but treating the molecule as OH seem to be rather no longer appropriate. And by the way, no one will ever expect you to suggest structure for molecules like that. And for that, you run software and see what's the lowest energy confirmation, and later you probably will look for some experimental evidence to back it up. And so that's more or less how this type of research is done. The last of the T set is TD. It's like T but with 3S4, the axis for S4 coincides with that of C2, and also we have 6 sigma dihedral. So it seems that D in TD stands for dihedral, and H in and TH stands for sigma H, and T is just T because it has the least number of symmetry operations, only rotation axis. So I finally don't have anything more to say, so let's move on to linear molecules. If the molecule has inversion, then it's D infinity H, and if it doesn't, then it's C infinity V. And I will mention how I interpret the symbols later when we talk about C and D sets, because then it will make more sense. So let's move to other groups. As we already said, when we run out of special cases, then we enter the flowcharts. We ask, is there primary axis and is there n C2 axis perpendicular to it? And depending if the answer is positive or not, we end up on the bottom left or bottom right side of the diagram. And by the way, for these groups, I'll be talking quite a lot about sandwich complexes. So these are the complexes where metal atom or ion is bound, or in other words, sandwiched, between two plane parallel organic ligands. Let's say that the molecule we're investigating has n C2 axis, and so we end up in D set. Again, H implies that there is sigma H in the group, so flat molecules like benzene immediately classify for that group. Now, with sandwich complexes, both ligands have to be identical for the molecule to have n C2 axis and to belong to D set. In D and H group, the rings will be eclipsed because that allows for presence of sigma H. In D and D group, the rings will be perfectly staggered, so here we again look at ferrocene, but the rings are rotated by 36 degrees with 
respect to one another. So that still allows for sigma dihedral. Lastly, in D group, there is no planes at all, because the rings are unevenly staggered. Now let's say there is no n c2 axis, so the next question is, is there s 2 n? So here we have some common generic shapes of molecules that belong to s 2 n. So there is some top and some bottom part, and also some directionality, and that what the spikes represent. So tetramethyl cold exactly matches with this description. But maybe let's take one step at a time, and let's look at unsubstituted cold first. So for flat C8H8, the Huckel approximation shows the molecule would be diradical. The molecule doesn't want that, and packers. We have four carbons that are a bit higher, and four that are a bit lower. From above, it looks like two stacked and rotated rectangles. Now the C2 is obvious, and S4 is obvious too, but the structure has also two C2 prime, and so it belongs to D set. Also we have two sigma dihedral, so it's D to D. Now when we add methyl substituents onto the ring, as we see here, two methyls are up and two are down, then we lose the sigma dihedral and the C2 prime, but C4 and S4 remain. So for this cold derivative, the group is S4. It's actually a good example, it shows, as I already mentioned, that you need to maintain some order in asking questions, and you need to look fairly for NC2 before allocating the molecule to S2N, because both the ND and S2N group have S2N symmetry elements. So here is another example, tetrabromoneopentane, that matches with the common generic S2N uh, shapes that we described. Two carbons are higher, two carbons are lower, and when you look from above, you see bromines are arranged with sense of directionality. Then another similar example, there are other structure types that occur in S2N group, for instance here we have tetragonal cobalt cluster and four CP rings, and notice that the rings are rotated in such a way that there is no planes of symmetry, but only S4, so that relative rotation of CP rings is a way of expressing directionality, but don't worry too much, it, it's a common sense that at exams there cannot be any molecules with a 3D shape that is hard to convey on a paper. If an exam was on laptops, then that potentially opens some door to more complex examples, but then, as I said, no chemist in real life assigns symmetry operations manually, so there is no much sense in doing hard exams either way. Lastly, if the molecule doesn't have n C2 axis perpendicular to the main axis and no S to n, then we end up in a C set. C and H molecules have sigma age. The same as DNH molecules, they are often distinctly based on polygons, flat or eclipsed. But in contrast to DNH, these molecules have sense of direction, as we can see here. If the molecule doesn't have sigma H, then we look for sigma V. It's a versatile group, but often there is some polygon and some sense of top and bottom. The sense of top and bottom can be created by the presence of a lone pair or by at least one of the axial substituents being different. Just notice that when both axial substituents are the same, then we recover n C2 axis and sigma H and the molecule now belongs to DNH. If there is no sigmas, the group is just CN. In this group, we might notice two archetypes, if you like. First, that the sandwich complexes with two different rings that have been unevenly staggered, or molecules with propellants-like structures. For example, here we have triphenylphosphine. Notice that phosphines have a lone pair, so the rings are pushed on one side. Also notice that if we swap phosphorus atom for arsenic, then the structure will be exactly the same because arsenic is below phosphorus in the periodic table. So, we are more or less done, that's the good news, let's go back to linear molecules, D infinity H and C infinity V. So I said that it will make more sense to mention it again when we are done with C and D groups. So you can perceive these groups as extensions to D and H and C and V, only that the principal axis is infinity fold. The idea is that because the molecule is linear, you can rotate by any angle. So for C infinity V, that results in infinity sigma vertical, but there is no sigma H, for D infinity H, that results in infinity of sigma sigma 2 axis perpendicular to the main axis, and there is sigma h. Now let's do some examples. Is this molecule a special case? No. What's the principal axis? C2. Are the two C2 axis perpendicular to that axis? No. Does it have S4? No. Does it have sigma h? That is sigma perpendicular to the main axis? No. Does it have sigma v? Yes, two actually. So the molecule symmetry is C2 v. Next example. It's not a special case. What is the principal axis? C3. Are the three C2 axes perpendicular to the main axis? Yes. Is the sigma H? Yes. So the molecule symmetry is D3H. Next example. We will take ethane, eclipsed and staggered. None of them, obviously, is a special case, but if you draw the structures from this perspective, it's essentially a Newman projection, then you'll be able to see that in both cases the main axis is C3. Eclipsed ethane can be simplified to two eclipsed triangles. You can immediately realize that there will be three C2 axes perpendicular perpendicular to the main axis, and there is sigma h. So the group is also, as in previous example, D3H. 
Now that's staggered ethane. As we said, principal axis is C3, and there are also three C2 axes perpendicular to the main axis. We can see one of the C2's axes very easily, but let's do the old school and let's pretend that we don't have 3D models. Where are the other two C2 axes? We have a clue from the first drawing. These C2's are 90 degrees to the two hydrogens, the hydrogens that are at 180 degrees to each other. There is no sigma H, but there are three sigma dihedral. And notice that it's characteristic uh, to D and D group that sigma d's are in between c2's, looking from this perspective. Now, how about if ethane was unevenly staggered? Easy, the symmetry will be then d3. What if we swap three hydrogens on one carbon with fluorines? Then it would be C3 because the top and bottom are different, and we lose the three C2s. Now I just want to mention some examples that I think might pop up on exam. So it's a metal with three oxalate ligands. There is nothing more other than C3 and three C2s, and so the symmetry is again D3. Notice that the rings made by oxalate ligands are planar. In this molecule, the rings are created by N ligands, and they are not planar. But if you assume that they are, then the symmetry will be D3. In the last example, the ligand's carbon backbone is planar, because there is conjugation, the middle carbon have been deprotonated. But notice we are assuming that the terminal CH3s are spherical, and that's fair, because there is a fast rotation. The last thing in this video is a quick review of flowcharts from some popular books. I only do this in case you are anxious about some uh, small variations between the flowcharts, and maybe they confuse you. The variations come from the fact that we are looking for just enough symmetry elements to recognize certain symmetry. We are not looking for all symmetry operations that a certain point group has. In other words, the flowcharts are allowed to be different. So anyway, Housecraft and Sharp does not include S2N group. That shows you that S2N symmetry is not that common, but still is the only book I came across that abandons S2N group entirely. The flowchart in TAR is neater, so that's good. What I don't like that much is that TAR asks about S2N last. If the molecule is not S2N, then it's CN. The problem is that you might forget about S2N altogether. So my professor pulled S2N as a separate question so that this group uh, stands out better and hopefully is not forgotten. The next author does the same thing, that is, S2N is addressed at the end. And then Atkins, he uses the presence of inversion and C5 to distinguish between polyhedrons. To me, it's easier to distinguish them on the presence of C3, C4, and C5, because that makes a pattern that is easier to remember. So that's all I have for you. Thank you for watching. Bye!